Hey, everybody, it's Jason Calacanis. And today on This Week in Startups, Jalik Joven Putra is on the program. She is an amazing female venture capitalist who's been doing it since 1999. And we have a rambling, awesome discussion on this week's episode about well, a little bit about the Ellen Power trial, a lot about how she invests, why she invests, and how companies are growing, and looking at a global perspective about how startups are crossing borders, M-Pesa, Bitcoin, Abra, lots of great name drops in this, and lots of great perspective um, on where the world is going. Really a global episode. Uh, stick with us. It's an amazing episode. That's what it's all about, man. Hey, shit. Funny is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Yeah. Funny is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. It's Jason Calacanis, and welcome to another episode of This Week in Startups. This is a program where we talk about technology, startups, being a founder, an entrepreneur, and the process of building products and services that might, if, if the stars align, change the world. And one of the big topics has been, where are all the female venture capitalists, right? We had the big Ellen Powell trial that put it front and center. There are not that many female venture capitalists. So, you know, producer Jackie is an amazing four-time Emmy award-winning producer, and we were talking. We're like, we have to find every female venture capitalist, get them on the program at some point in the next year or two. And of course, uh, Jalik. Uh, now, you, when did you start in venture capital? Nineteen ninety-nine. Okay, so uh, Jalik Joben Putra. Joben Putra. Jalik Joben Putra. I got it. Jalik like Halik. That's easy for me to remember because <laughs> I was it's like hey, Halik sticking on the top of my head. Joben Putra. You started in 1999 in venture capital. Yes. What was it like back then? And let's have like a frank talk about, since it is the topic of the moment, women in venture capital. It's changed a lot in 16 years or has it? Well, like I, I definitely see more women in venture um, at junior levels more than mm-hmm. I used to. Uh, but, I mean, there's just a Babson study that was done, right, uh, that said the actual number of senior women in the industry has, has gone down. So it went from 10 percent in, I believe it was 1999, to 6 uh, percent now. So the senior positions have actually gone down. And there's a lot of junior positions. We say junior position. What does a junior position in a venture capital firm actually mean in terms of what you do and how important you are? Because... Ellen Powell was hired as not an executive assistant, but a chief of staff, which is kind of, I think, you know, like a souped up uh, assistant, admin, thinker, you know, that pairs with someone like John Doerr, correct? Well, I, I, you know, not a lot of venture firms have that role, so yeah. I can't speak to exactly, you know, what she did. Um, right. But I'm sure there was a strategic element to it. I mean, yeah. she did it after business school, I believe, so I don't think it yeah. was a, a very junior role. Yeah. Um, yeah, she's definitely not an admin if she's got an MBA. Right. So right. She, chief of staff means something a little more than that. Yeah. yeah, like when I was at Intel. So I started off in venture at Intel Capital, and um, Andy Grove had a chief of staff that, um, you know, was a very senior person in, yeah. at the company. Would write speeches, probably. Well, that was part of the role, I Strategy. believe. Strategy. <laughs> and, and gets to travel, you know, uh, yeah. yeah, and make sure, um, you know, everything's okay when he's traveling. But, um, but What I, about I, those junior roles? What are those yeah. like? So I, um, you know, it's usually an analyst or an associate. Uh, it can be pre-MBA or just post-MBA. Um, they're responsible for uh, sourcing uh, deals and, and doing diligence on deals. Um, it really varies on, on the firm in terms of how much responsibility, how much decision-making power, you know, or input they can have. And, and, and so I'd say the smaller the firm, the more, you know, they're able to, to step up and, and, and be a more of a key part of the investment team. So when you were an associate back in 1999 at Intel. I wasn't. Oh, you were an associate. I, I've never been an what associate. What did you come in uh, as? So Intel Capital, which is, uh, the, I believe, the largest corporate venture uh, yeah, for sure. uh, yeah. you know, entity out there, um, uh, has a, a, it was a strategic investment manager, but I was basically responsible for deals from sourcing all the way through sitting on boards. Uh, oh, really? Yeah, so it is yeah. like being a partner. Yeah, then. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you started as a partner. 
Pretty Basically. much. Uh, yeah. <laughs> How did you get that done? Because don't you have to start as an associate? Well, Intel uh, just isn't set up that way because, huh. um, I mean, what they were doing at the time, and I, I'm not sure how much this may have changed, but they're taking people with experience huh. and, and then also people who can interact with their business units uh, as well as, you know, external investors. And, and, and what was the climate like in venture capital back then? Because it's fascinating to me that the actual senior positions have declined. What do you attribute that to, do you think? Well, you know, I, I, I'm not sure. <laughs> it's, 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 um, I, I do see a lot of drop off. I see, you know, and, and venture in general has drop off between, you know, junior positions and then who gets promoted up to partner. So, you know, I think uh, regardless of gender, there, there is a lot of drop off in venture where um, associates may leave, go get some operational experience and maybe never come back. I mean, mm. the, you know, some of them just enjoy being operators uh, more. And at the end of the day, venture is a slog. I mean, venture capital and a career in venture, I mean, it's exciting. I love it. Obviously, I've been doing it for 16 years. But but um, it's not as glamorous as people tend to think it is. Yeah. Um, and, and so uh, it, it really requires, you know, a lot of kind of resilience and loving, you know, loving all of it, right? Mm. All the, you know, day to day of what you're doing. So would the fact that it's maybe so male dominated lead you to believe that maybe that's why women don't make it to those senior positions? That maybe they're dropping off in a higher percentage than men because it's so male dominated. Is do you have friends who are females who left and said, "Gosh, you know, it's just too much of an old boys club." Or well, I just don't I, like working with friends who left and went into private equity, which is interesting. <laughs> Even more. Of a I mean, club. well, you know, there is there is definitely a quicker return to to capital uh, in in private equity than there is in ventures. Yeah. So that goes back to really. You know, enjoying the whole process and the longer time horizons that you're dealing with in, hmm. in venture. Um, but I, you know, look, there's any time you have a, a dominant, um, you know, demographic. And I was a banker before I, I did venture. I was an entrepreneur after banking, but um, uh, you know, spent three years on Wall Street. Uh, so I'm very kind of familiar with with these uh, male-dominated, um, strong culture environments and. Um, you know, it, it's uh, you. You know, do have to. I mean, a lot of stuff that came up during the trial. You know, that that stuff does happen, right? Yeah. And um, and hopefully things are changing. And I think the trial was was great in terms of uh, shining light on you know some of these more subtle biases. And and most of the time they're not malicious. Right. Yeah. So when she doesn't get invited to the ski trip, and it's just a bunch of guys going, and hey, we're going to have a guy time. It doesn't sound malicious, but it right. is holding back people's career if you run it like a boys club, doesn't yes, it? Absolutely, because um, you know a lot of the deal making and and um, networking happens, you know, out of the office, and um, and it's uh, really you know key to build those relationships for a long career and, and venture. So, see, I thought that that was the biggest load of BS when I heard that, yeah. and the email said stuff like well, you know, we don't have enough rooms and the woman wouldn't be comfortable here. To me, that was some sexist BS because it's like, we're going to Aspen. There's not another place in Aspen for a woman to stay that's not, you know, sleeping in the bunk next to the guys who are having a guy time. Yeah. I mean, it's complete BS, don't you think? Well, you know, look, I wasn't in the room. I wasn't, you know, but I, I you know, these things happen and, and yeah. they need to change. And I think the only way things are going to change, quite honestly, is just to have more of a balance. And, mm. you know, I love to see uh, women come into the industry. I think women uh, make great investors. Um, and, and there are lots of studies that have been done with other asset classes on, on you know, the returns that, that uh, female investors um, uh, get versus men. So I, you know, I, I just want to see more of a balance. You know, I, I like working with both genders. I'd love to work with more women. So you like humans. I like humans. You like yeah, humans. You kind of have to like gender. humans. You kind of have to like <laughs> humans to be in this business. So you, you talked before about like, hey, it's hard and you have to, I guess, be resilient and you have to be sort of made for the venture space. What is hard about being a venture capitalist? <laughs> I know, everybody you know, else I, is hearing you say that and watch the other power I was like, <laughs> what, what's hard about making a half million dollars a year yeah, and going well, to Aspen you know, I, <laughs> for work? I, I'm running my own fund. I, I'm not making half a million dollars <laughs> a year. 
Um, and uh, it's it's really, I mean, you know, especially doing your own fun like I am right now. I mean, you're you're uh, you're an entrepreneur, right? Mm. You're I'm spending just as much time uh, working as my entrepreneurs. I mean, in some way, you know, in a lot of ways, I feel like that I'm, I'm more aligned with them than I've ever been. Mm. And um, uh, but you know, it, it is. Uh, I mean, VCs have to fundraise, right? Um, mm-hmm. they, uh, have LPs and investors that they need to send updates to and, you know, quarterly, you know, financial, um, you know, yearly audits. And, and so there, there's just a lot of, uh, similarities, um, of, of running a fund and, and running a company. I mean, you are running a company and, um, uh, and, and, and so, you know, and, and then you have to do deals and, and manage the investments and, and be able to, um, uh, to, to manage your time appropriately um, between those and know when you have to spend time with certain entrepreneurs. And, and that's where it becomes a real people business, right? All right. When we get back from the commercial break, I want to talk to you about your portfolio and how you pick companies. What's your thesis after these 16 years as a venture capital when we get back? with Jalik on This Week in Startups. And let me just take a moment, a pause for the cause, to say thank you to our friends at Moo. They uh, make amazing business cards, and they make amazing stationery, beautiful, thick, full of small little details that will help you stand out. Yes, Moo cards are different. They're designed to be delightful, and I use them myself. They have the little mini cards, which I'm a huge fan of. They have the triple thick Lux cards uh, that are just gorgeous. And their latest edition is, of course, the letter press. Those are the fancy old school type. And they've got a full line of business stationery and promotional material. And they all help you break through, start conversations, and look brilliant when you're in the marketplace. And they're all super, super affordable. And you can put a different image uh, or text on every card. So if you're going to an event, that's what I like to do, like when we go and have the launch festival, we might put four or five different pictures from the launch festival, different years, different speakers. Here's a picture of Mark Cuban. Here's a picture of you know, Glenn Beck or Krasaka on the back of the cards. And that is exclusive to Moo, this print affinity where you can put different images and text on each card and have a collection of cards. Um, they have great designer templates. So you don't have to spend a whole bunch of money on designers. Uh, that was always the root, you know, waste of money for entrepreneurs to go spend $10,000 on stationery. We used to do that in the old days. Now you just go to Moo.com and you get it for just tens of dollars. It's super, super um, affordable. And premium is their standard. So everything's rich, thick, and lovely. Uh, save 25%. On all printed products and accessories when you order by Wednesday, April 29th. Yes, order by Wednesday, April 29th, and you will get 25% off on all products and accessories. Head over to moo.com, M O O.com, and everybody thank at M O O.com. I love reading ads. <laughs> yeah, I'm a lucky guy because I only read ads for things I love. I've been using Moo cards for 10 years, so I like, love them. Moo's great. You love them, right? Yeah, it's like great. Yeah, you need yeah, to order easy. cards. It's easy, and yep. you can do it yourself yep. in like 10 minutes, and it's fun to do with a little yep. builder. And you're all, you're, It's just one of those very well-done products. I'm so lucky to read a product. for. It's like reading like – if I had to read an ad for my favorite restaurant, it would be like, I love the steak frites here. It's like I love Moo. It's my steak frites. All right. Um, how do you pick companies to invest in? Well, you have to have some signaling now. What is your signaling? What is your secret to like going, hmm, I can just tell this person's going to change the world? Or this idea is going to change the world. What is it? Yeah, I think it's a combination of, of the person and, and their vision. Um, and, I mean, you always hear about how important it's, it's really about the entrepreneur, right? And, mm. and because the markets are moving so quickly now and, and there's so many, you know, competitors in any space popping up. So, you know, one of the things I really look for is, is someone who's very passionate about their idea and, and, and the idea's ability to change the world, uh, ability to sell other people on it, right? Because mm. that, that needs to happen quickly quicker than ever before in this in this environment that we're in and um, and then the idea has to be um, compelling enough I mean I, I spend time with my portfolio companies I'm constantly thinking about them I'm thinking about them yeah you know, before I go to sleep when I wake up in the morning and 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 I want to be passionate about what the companies uh, I'm investing in are doing and that's how I think I can also be most helpful so um, you know I get lots of I mean hundreds of uh, proposals, um, even through my own network, you know, uh, uh, each year, and um, and and that I, I really look at, you know, how can I and and the fund help this this um, uh, entrepreneur? And so you have so much deal flow after all this time yeah. that you have more than enough, you know, qualified companies to invest in. You have to find one you're stoked about yes. to use a word. Absolutely, it's almost yeah. like a founder investor fit. I like that. 
Like you have to be, because if you're not super stoked to go to work for the company and tweet about it and meet with them, it's kind of a bummer for all, everybody, right? Yeah, I mean, I'm out there selling the company, you know, when I'm um, talking um, hmm. to you know, potential partners they may have or um, later stage investors, right? And I, I want to believe in that company um, uh, just as much as the entrepreneur does. All right. Tell me, what, what company founder, when they came to meet with you, did you within a minute know that you were in founder love, like, and wanted to invest in it. Like, you know, like that, like when you fall in love and you're just like, Oh God, I'm so in love. Like when you just like fall in love with the idea and the founder, you're just like, Oh my God, I have to invest in it. Yeah. Like you're not even a, it happened to me with Uber and Thumbtack. Like I wasn't even a minute into these companies and Goala too. I was just like, God, this product is so gorgeous. Like I got to give this person money and go, which, which one was the one that you had that with? Well, there, there have been several over the years. I mean, one that you're very familiar with is Abra. Um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Abra, we they, both invested in that. Yeah, and they, explain to everybody what Abra was like, and take me to that moment where you met Bill. So, um, Abra is, just launched at the launch festival. Actually, won what, what they won, they won the top, the overall, the, the overall yeah, award, right? Yeah. Um, and they did a round uh, about nine months ago, mm-hmm. um, and I, I met Bill while he was raising that round. And um, Abra is using the blockchain, so the Bitcoin infrastructure. Uh, to create uh, a network of, uh, of uh, tellers around the world that are connected by smartphones. So kind of like an Uber for, um, for uh, remittance and, and uh, cash transfer across borders. Um, I have spent a lot of time in the emerging markets and, mm. um, and, and, and in Kenya specifically, which is kind of ground zero. You spent time global. in Kenya. I was actually born in Nairobi. Oh, okay. And, uh, so you definitely to, spent time there. <laughs> and I have invested uh, in, in Kenya. I actually, one of my other portfolio companies is BitPesa, um, which is... You're an investor in BitPesa? Yeah, yeah. We just had a board meeting this morning. Oh, um, do explain BitPesa for everybody <laughs> well, who doesn't let know. Me, let me go back to Abra. All right, right go back to Abra. <laughs> Let's go back to Abra. Right. So, um, so Bill is a very experienced entrepreneur in, in uh, the uh, cross-border uh, uh, remittance uh, and mobile or, or uh, you know, cash transfer space. And uh, that combination of this vision, you know, when I first heard about Bitcoin, immediately I thought about M-Pesa, which is the... Um, the mobile money system in Kenya, where you know the majority of the GDP actually goes through this mobile money system, and I thought this you know Bitcoin and blockchain infrastructure can actually be the impesa for the rest of the world, right? Um, where there are no real boundaries that you can do these uh, transactions on your phone with lower fees than if you were going through all these intermediaries. So he represented exactly you know what I thought. The, the real potential or some of the real potential of this new uh, infrastructure could be. And then you combine it with um, his passion for it. I mean, he'd spent a lot of time learning about Bitcoin and, and you know, thinking about it in a really smart, strategic way of, you know, how do you work with the current infrastructure and how is it going to, you know, mm. build over time? And, and, and then, you know, all his experience. I mean, he's a grown-up founder who, uh, yes, you know. Yes, he's not a 20-something. <laughs> he's over 40. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't have, look, I have nothing against, you know, first-time founders. But, you know, this is a big, big vision. And, yeah. and knowing that someone knows the space so well, has been working in the space for a while, um, you, you don't know, count it against them. Difference. You don't count it, count it against them. I mean, yeah. the, the bias in our industry is against people who are over forty starting companies. What do you think of that? Well, you know, look, I, 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 um, I think San Francisco and New York, you know, are are very uh, are somewhat different in in that way, right? Because um, you have a lot of domain experts mm. in in New York who you know have been in their respective industries of financial services or media. Um, or fashion, you know, any of these industries, they uh, they've been they built first careers and and are now transitioning over to yeah. a more digital. So by definition, careers. they're so, going to be thirty or forty or fifty. Right, right, and you do have the younger uh, founders too, right out of school, who are, who are building great companies. Also, you know, I, yeah. I backed those as well as older founders. And, yeah. Um, so I I think it's um, you know it depends on what they're trying to do, who they've gathered around them mm. to execute on that. And um, and what kind of expertise they're able to bring in if they don't have it? Yeah. Right? Um, so you mentioned M Pesa before. Yes. Or is it M Pesa? Pesa? 
Well, I, uh, it's pronounced, I've heard it pronounced both ways. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, M, M pesa um, is, my understanding of it is, in Kenya, you buy minutes for your phone, mm-hmm. and the minutes for your phone in some way equal the currency. And people don't have bank accounts, but they have minutes and M-Pesas on their phone that they can trade to do commerce. And then there are people who buy and sell minutes with cash and put them on your phones who are like these virtual real-world ATMs. Am I correct in what I've read? Well, they have – so it's – there is, they do have M Pesa, so it, it's not just minutes, but they can, they buy them as, you know, they can uh, use their um, uh, account, mm-hmm. their mobile phone account to buy, you know, M Pesa. Yeah. Uh, so the digital currency, which then they can send to other folks who then um, uh, redeem these and get cash at these kiosks. So if you travel to Kenya, you know, you see these green M Pesa um, uh, kiosks. Everywhere. I mean, it, it's how you know, long just has that been it. going on? Oh, um, I think it was established in. It, they first started in '04. Wow. Um, so, I mean, yeah, good. I think good, good ten Isn't years. Isn't it fascinating ago. that, like, I, I don't know if Kenya would. I don't want to use the word third world because I kind of feel like the third world is kind of an insult. What yeah. emerging market or not the sort of what you would consider the first world? But what's a way to say it without being a jerk? What's what's the non-offensive word? Is there a world offensive? Well, you, you know, I, I, I don't use, I try to avoid using third world yeah. because I think it's so silly in, it's in silly. today's day and age. Uh, but, it isn't, you know, but they're not like, it's not like it's the United States or, right. you know, happening in London or Hong Kong. Right. They created an, a virtual currency and yeah. got it to market yeah. a decade before us. And we don't even have it humming here. Right. Well, it's, it's funny that when I was there five, five years ago and, um, you know, I was just learning how it worked and, and uh, they were like, well, but you're from... You're from America. Like, yeah. Don't tell me you don't have this there. <laughs> like, we just got, you know, we just got phones like about the same time, you know, mobile phones about the same time. That's hilarious. You guys did. So, Who, is, this, uh, is it state owned m Yeah. Or? So, you know, this is, this is the distinction, which, you know, when people try to replicate um, mm. uh, the, what m has been to Kenya, it's hard to do so because they have, um, it's a joint venture with Safaricom, which mm. is basically a monopoly, right, um, uh, which is the telecom provider. It's like their Verizon. Um, right. Well, yeah, but you have AT&T here. I mean, right. they, it's more like their yeah. SK Telecom where they have 80% <laughs> I mean, market yeah, share. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a high amount of market share. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and then with, uh, so they, uh, and then they're partnering with the bank there. Mm. So it, you know, it's all state owned. Um, mm. and, and so it's all a monopoly, right? And, so a little bit controlled. Yes, not as much yes. fear of fraud. Right. Harder to hack. Yes. Ostensibly, but well, maybe yeah, not. Yeah. yeah, but it's um, theoretically. So, but when when the system goes down, it, it halts the economy. That just happened a few weeks ago. The system and, went down. Yeah. And what happens just, when nobody... the when your currency goes down? <laughs> right. I, it's mean, like it, losing... it, I think it's a, a very interesting case for you know as we talk about digital currency and the things we need to pay attention to and impact like yeah. you know it can have. You know, that's a nice little microcosm of, of, of seeing, you know, how to deal with some of it's these It's truly things. scary because yeah. if you think about the Mt. Gox implosion, the early um, Bitcoin place, I knew of people who had significant amounts of money there. And mm-hmm. it did rattle their lives to the point which it could be a run on the banks. Mm-hmm. When we get back on this week in startups, I want to talk a little bit more about this virtual currency and then take your questions, the audience's questions, uh, and if you want to uh, give us your question, just uh, put at TWI Startups if you're watching on Twitter and then uh, or at Jason. You can follow either of us and producer Jackie will give you the form to fill out. Uh, let me take a moment and thank Wistia, which does an amazing job doing business to business video. Why do you need business to business video? Because if you use the free video services out there, what they do and they're really good at it is they take your audience and they convert it into their audience. So whenever you use those players from the other big companies, what do they do? Anywhere you click on it, it gets them back to their site where you're going to watch Gangnam Style and whatever other viral video and they steal your users. Then at the end, they give you a promo for other related videos from your competitors. And then they have all your data. And then they don't let you collect emails. They don't let you put annotations clicking off to the things you want to do with your content. That's why we use Wistia because we want to collect your email. We want to control the experience on thisweekinstartups.com. So you stick around and you watch our content. We're not here to market our competitors' content. We're not here to give the data over to some big, giant Internet company. No offense to my friends who work at that big, giant Internet company. I won't say their name. 
but Wistia gives us control of it. Just like we want control of our mailing list from MailChimp, or just like we want control of our websites with Squarespace, Wistia is in that class of product. It's a gorgeous, awesome product that I missed investing in, and I want to kill myself over. I literally begged the entrepreneur to let me invest, and he's like, ah, you know, we make money. We don't need money. Don't you hate when that happens? And you're like, take my money, and they're like, well, we, we, well, we make money. Why would we take your money? I'm like, ugh. Uh, but the reason so I want you to t- is a tough job. It is tough. <laughs> I'm like throwing bricks. I'm throwing bricks. I got bricks of cash. Please take my money. Anyway, Mailchimp, Moz, HubSpot, Zendesk, Herman Miller, Sam Adams, and this week in startups all use the amazing product that is known as Wistia. W I S T I A. Wistia, 140,000 customers, and they um, when they started partnering with us on this week in startups, they only had like 50,000. They've tripled in a year. Amazing analytics, trends, viewer streams. You can see down to the viewer how long viewer, specific viewers watched videos if they went back and watched another section again. And you can capture email addresses before and after the video plays. So you can say, hey, before you watch this video, would you like to join our mailing list? You know what? We add dozens and dozens of emails a day. And when you have emails, you have power because you own your customers, not YouTube or somebody else. There's a reason why YouTube and Facebook will obscure and not let you collect email addresses because they want you to be dependent on them and their ad networks. If you're a smart entrepreneur, you'll use Wistia and you get control of your own mailing list. Better to own 1,000 emails than to have 10,000 or 100,000 subscribers on YouTube or followers and likes on Facebook where they're just going to make you pay through the nose to buy back your own customers. It's insane. Don't you think that's insane when they did that and they just make you pay for your Facebook friends again? I hate that. That's why you need tools like Wistia, so you can get control of your destiny. Uh, and by the way, they have tons of support, 24 hours, all that kind of stuff if you need help. New tools and features uh, specifically for marketers, um, and you're not going to get that on Vimeo and YouTube. Tons of resources will help you get off the ground. Uh, guys for choosing the right microphone, building a lightning setup for $100, using videos and emails together, all that stuff. They train everybody how to do it, and you can start a two-week free trial. Uh, wistia.com slash twist wistia.com slash twist no credit card is required and you can upload as many videos as you like they're just a dynamite company and a fantastic product that will let you control how your content is distributed and help you build your direct relationship with your audience which is critical thank you wistia all right i love reading ads for products i use i had to get that off my chest about just everybody's like using these other people's platforms and then they wind up yeah. You're like, have you ever talked to your customers? Like, I don't know who my customers are. It's like, well, it's kind of your job as an entrepreneur. What makes you crazy about entrepreneur? Like, entrepreneurs are hard to deal with, right? People talk about venture capitalists are hard to deal with. Entrepreneurs, I mean, you know, they they became entrepreneurs for a reason. What are some pet peeves you have, like things that really entrepreneurs should focus on doing better that will help them succeed more? What are the common mistakes entrepreneurs make in your in your mind? And then you, we'll get into yeah. VCs and the mistakes they make. Yeah, How can they do a better job? That's a good question. So I, um, I mean, what I, I see often from a pitch all the way through, you know, um, uh, the company as it grows is just being aware of the competitive landscape and where potential competition can come from. And it's not the, the obvious ones, you know, the, the folks that are directly in the market, but understanding, like having a more holistic view of the market, right? And, and, um, and so sometimes entrepreneurs, you know, can be so heads down building and, and, and not looking up and, and seeing, you know, what else is going on. And, mm. and, um, and that's where advisory boards, where investors, if they're doing, you know, their job, they should be uh, alerting entrepreneurs to, you know, or or at least sharing a point of view uh, of, of the broader market and where it's headed. Um, Getting out into the real world helps, doesn't it, as an entrepreneur? We find sometimes they lock themselves in their offices and just yeah. go down the feature death march. Yeah, this whole idea of just working 24-7 I don't think is is healthy for the individual nor the business um, mm. and, and, you know, the outcome of the business. Work smarter. Yes. Yeah, I always tell people, get out in the real world, talk yeah. to those customers. Yeah. All right. Um, Here's a question from the audience, and it's anonymous, but uh, without a warm intro, what's the best way to get your attention? That's a good question. So warm intro is obvious. Yes. Like, hey, if yeah. Jason emails Jalik or yeah. if Jalik emails Jason, that's a warm intro, like Abra. We might trade you know, deals like that. Yep. What's the best way to get your attention if it's not a warm intro? Well, I, um, I, I, I do take cold intros, and uh, they often come in through LinkedIn or, um, uh, or uh, somebody gets hold of my email somehow, and that shows some initiative. Yeah. But, um, I mean, I, I have a blog. I've been writing in it uh, for many years, since 07. The and- Barefoot Venture Capitalist. 
Bear with me, see. see. Yes, yes. What, 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 hold on a second. I'm take a little <laughs> are, side are here. Are we getting distracted again? <laughs> I got. I, that's the. You, you obviously have not watched this program. Um, <laughs> Yes, we're going to get distracted. What, 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 what is the Barefoot VC about? Are you retired on an island somewhere? What does yeah. this mean? Well, I, I like Unpack. islands. I, I like, well. you know, look, I'm, I'm um, you know, I, I've done some pretty adventurous traveling in my days. You know, really? I, I've like, uh, I hitchhiked around Burma by myself in 2007, you know, right when the protests were starting and they started while I was there. It was during this around the world trip I did um, and went to the Himalayas and, and hung out there and hiked uh, for a week and um, have gone to the Congo, spent some time in Rwanda, went over to the Congo, got a driver myself. And, and you went to the Congo and Rwanda? Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> So, kind of dangerous, is it not? Um, you know, or is it, it safer now? I, 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 my view is it's important to get out there, and the media reports one thing, right? Mm-hmm. And and the reality uh, on the ground, I mean, some of it's close, right? But I'm not I'm not going when there's an active war necessarily. But I think it's important to really see what's really going on, and that's where you know the barefoot VC comes from. So I wanted something that captured kind of who I am, mm. and I also think. The application or the the um, uh, the link back to venture is that I think the best VCs are close to the ground, like ah. you know, if like they're not somewhere and you know sitting in some nice office complex somewhere yeah. and and just sitting there day in and day out and taking pitches, but they're out there in the real world experiencing mm. you know what everybody else is experiencing, and that's how you spot trends. That's how you stay ahead of things. Got and, it. And that's that was the link back. You're to brave. VC. I, yeah. I would never go to Rwanda or Saudi Arabia. Uh, or any Rwanda place. is very stable no. right now. Is it stable now? Yeah, yeah. Any yeah. of those places that have like a State Department warning, I'm a coward. I, would, I wouldn't go. Yeah. You know why? My life is so good right now, and yeah. I work so hard to make it good. Yes. I don't want to risk it. Yeah, I don't. I don't. I, I don't know, want to go anywhere yeah. dangerous. Yeah, but you know, you it could be dangerous just walking out the door, right? Like, uh, I, I think you have to of be course. smart when you're doing those yeah. things. But I, I think the media also blows certain things out of proportion. I like the State Department's approach to it. Like, yeah. Mexico City, probably not a good idea for Americans. You know, like, yeah. can't cool it? Okay, maybe. You know, although that's been known to be dangerous around there. Is it so, too? Yeah. Yeah, but. Yeah. You know. you know what? I'll go to Hawaii. I'll go to, I'll go to Hawaii <laughs> no, and Italy. Hawaii is always a good option. <laughs> Hawaii and Italy. That's it. I'll go to the, I'm not going anywhere dangerous. Yeah. I, I'm a coward. I just I have to say, you know, I get invited all the time. I, I'm kind of really torn about the Middle East because I feel like I need to understand it better. It's like the most important. Per, it's a very, there's a lot of important things going on in the Middle East. Yeah. Good things and bad. And I feel like I need to understand it more. But I also feel like I don't want to engage with it because I think it's so bad in some ways, like the human rights issues in Saudi yeah. Arabia and ISIS I mean, and this it, it, and that. It's tricky, right? Because um, on one hand, you know, you can say you don't want to engage, but the only way to create change is to engage and, mm-hmm. and try, you know. And, and so a few years ago, I went on, um, I think it was the Aspen Institute asked me to um, be on a delegation when uh, the King of Jordan was opening up the, the incubator space, the Oasis 500 there. And, um, you know, I was amazed. This was like three or four years ago. And, and half of the entrepreneurs in that incubator space were women. Hmm. And, you know, the perception we get sitting here is that, you know, it's, it's a horrible place. And, and they're obviously Saudi and, you know, there are certain places that uh, are not so great for women and women's rights. But um, here you have a, a country smack in the middle of all of that, which, you know, their ratios are, are better than what we see here. <laughs> it is and, really, yeah, it, so, it really is paradoxical yeah. um, where you have some countries in the Middle East or even going over to Pakistan where like, you just have this range of human rights. Yeah. One place is caning their wives and daughters. Another place is throwing acid in the faces of their wives and daughters. Yeah. And then the other places are having women, entrepreneurs, founders, presidents, right. and in Congress and Senates and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I mean, and if you look at India, I mean, India is on fire right now um, from a startup and, and uh, tech perspective, right? Hmm. And um, so, so many of these, you know, lar- these companies that are getting funded are, are started by women. And that's, you know, in a country where, you know, you still have child brides, right, in, in the rural areas. Yeah. So it, it, it is. Um, but I, I do think that uh, engaging and trying to support, you know, where you can and, and yeah. uh, help try to further some of that change, it, it matters. Yeah. 
I gotta, I'm, I'm obviously, <laughs> I haven't convinced. this show's yeah. not all about me though. So we'll start with that. So what, when you get those warm emails back to the question of our yeah. anonymous, uh, 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 person here, um, so let's unpack it a little bit more. You get the mm-hmm. LinkedIn, somebody gets your email, they guess your email, whatever it is. Right. In full contact it or do report it or one of these reverse lookups, who knows? Yep. Um, is there something in an email that makes uh, it easier for you to say, I'm going to take the meeting? Well, it is. Um, uh, what, what I was starting to say um, before we got distracted yeah. <laughs> was that, you know, I, I have my point of view out there very much, um, you know, what, what I'm interested in looking at, what I'm excited about. And, um, and the entrepreneurs I respond to are the ones that make a link back to, you know, what my thesis is, what I care about, what I've written about in the uh. past. And, and show how their company is addressing it. I mean, sometimes a link is tenuous, and I can pick that up, and other times it, it is a, a stronger fit. And, um, and, and so if I feel like they've done their research and, you know, they're not, I mean, sometimes I get emails addressed to another VC. That's always <laughs> great when they right? cut and paste it and they're yeah. like, dear John Doerr, <laughs> right. I'm a huge fan of your investment in WebVan. Right. <laughs> you're like, I'm not John Doerr. No, or I get, a, I get a Mr. Joven Putra, right? Yes. <laughs> then... Mr. Jo- Mr. Putra. You're like, Joven Putra. You're like, Mr. Joven Putra, uh, was, you, you reply back and say, I've CC'd my dad. <laughs> no, I, I don't. Well, he's Dr. Joven Putra. Oh, okay. So. <laughs> um, and no, I, I don't respond to those. Yeah. Yes, I'd rather and, spend huh. energy responding to the folks that, you know, have done a little bit of, of uh, I research. I think it's amazing, like a Chris Saka email today where somebody, um, he just emailed a quote, if I could just have 30 minutes of your time to explain my idea. Oh, yeah, I saw that. <laughs> and you're laughing. Well, yeah, unpack why that is so laughable for, like, people who are busy venture right. capitalists and angel investors. Why is that such a horrible approach? Well, it's, it's, I mean, A, if we were to um, accept that 30 minutes from everybody who asks for just a little bit of time, and, and that was pretty bold to say just 30 minutes, because that's <laughs> actually a large chunk of time, right? Yep. And, um, it, it, I mean, we would never sleep. I mean, we'd be, you know, triple booked, right? right. I, I mean, the number of people, like, my day is just spent, like, back to back, you know, meetings. Right. Right. And, and, um, and I try to spend Fridays to think and absorb and, and not take meetings, Mm -hmm. um, because I think it's important to have that time. And, um, it just shows a lack of understanding (laughs) of, 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 you know, the, the, you know, what this person does all day and and how, you know, even I I get the five minutes, I just want to grab five minutes or I'll take you to coffee. Yeah. You know, (laughs) thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I'll take you to coffee and pick your brain. And, um, you know, I would love to accept more of those. Um, but it's just not possible to do that. And the better approach is to understand who you're pitching, target your pitch. Like you're saying, having read their blog. Yeah. Such a better approach. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, a lot of VCs and investors will tell you how to approach them on their Twitter feeds and what works for them. Mm-hmm. To not actually do your research yeah. just shows like almost a level of cluelessness that would preclude somebody from investing in you. Yes. Because if I invest in you and then you start doing that to clients, yeah. they're going to laugh you out of the room. Yeah, and that's a good point, right? I mean, the approach is is very indicative. I mean, that's how they're going to approach customers or potential employees. And, you know, it, it's a kind of a maturity level of interacting with people. And Yeah, my favorite is... Um, uh, I'm working on a project. It's called Abra, and it does money transfer. I know that you were very involved in Mpesa, and you were born in Kenya, in fact. Um, here's what it looks like. Uh, this is an early mock-up in Envision. Please don't share it. And if this is of interest to you, I'd love to answer any questions you might have. I'm sure email would be the most efficient. Mm-hmm. So now you've basically said, like, I, 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 yeah. I just want to be efficient with you. Right. I'm showing you the mock-ups, yeah. uh, and I know that you're interested in it. That's how I would yeah. craft the message, which is I'm respecting your time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Another question from our audience. What advice do you have for someone who wants to land an associate gig at a VC firm? Please be as specific as possible. Wow. <laughs> and that's from Arjan and Nathan. Arja Nathan on Twitter. Great. Andrew uh, Jude is his name. So I would say that um, uh, 
it's important to know, like, if, if you're going to add value to VC, um, you know, having a point of view around thesis areas or, you know, companies that you find interesting that you would potentially bring to the VC or even, um, you know, that's in the VC's current portfolio, right, that you're particularly excited about. And that's one thing I ask, you know, when I'm... Um, when I'm hiring, right, it's um, uh, what, what companies in the portfolio, in the current portfolio, would you do you think are the most interesting? Which ones do you think are questionable and mm. why? And it's really how, what is the thought process of, of, of um, this person who wants to help pick companies or source companies? And, um, and I'd say, you know, be persistent. I, it's, I mean, there's certain larger VCs that have associate programs um, and, and they will list those. And, you know, I, I'd say, you know, get to know as much of the team as you can um, over time. And, and be in front of them as, and, and try to add value, you know, send companies their way that they could be uh -huh. interested in. I yeah. mean, that's the, you know, if you send a, a really great company my way, you're going to catch my attention. That's right? a pretty good one, right? Yeah, like, yeah. yeah, I sent you Abra, and then it's like, well, do you have any more? It's like a pretty good <laughs> right. way to start the conversation. Right, right. Uh, but I do love the long game, getting to know everybody in and yeah. around a company. Yeah. The other thing I might add to that is um, be an expert on some topic, like really have passion and expertise, like the fact that you know so much about virtual currencies and you know, have investments in the space and can speak to it. Um, I guess what came up in the Alien Power Trial was a thought leadership, right? Mm -hmm. Like when you have some thought leadership, mm -hmm. it kind of does separate you, doesn't it? In, in this sort of very, uh, you know, limited attention time period we're in. Yeah, and I, I think also the ability to learn new areas, right? Because we are in in kind of this high velocity environment, right? And um, and I I think adding value is also kind of coming up with new areas of expertise and being able to do that and 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 showing that you have the ability to do that is important. Uh, okay, and. Um... So another question, would it be positive to establish a board observer program for women so they can gain experience in and having a stepping stone into corporate boardrooms uh, as strategic directors? Uh, we, we have like a, another dismal like uh, sort of, and that's from Chris Nunelli uh, on Twitter. Uh, we have a pretty dismal track record as well of having females on boards. Mm -hmm. how, how do you think we could solve that? Is, is this a good good? Um, Proposal here, board observers, or is that? You know, I, I, um, Do board, I, board positions matter. I, I think it's very important to have diversity on boards. Yeah. Um, I mean, we've seen so many scandals kind of get swept under the rug because we have uh, kind of this old uh, boys, and I'm, it's not necessarily that they're all old boys, right? But but this network that is very chummy with each other, and, and they, they really fail on the governance side, right, um, of what a board is supposed to do and hold, um, you know, management accountable for different things. So um, I I think a diversity on boards is very important. I, I think there are tons of women who have the ability right now to serve on boards. They're just not... Asked. Uh, asked to do it. Yeah. And, and so this whole idea that they need training, um, I mean, everybody needs training for their first board, but come on, the yeah. women are out there. And yeah. just try a little harder to find them. I, and it does seem like because the venture capital industry takes the first couple of board seats mm -hmm. and it's 90% plus male, yeah. it's just mirroring that. Yes. And then that goes off and, you know, perhaps – makes the founders and the existing board have to reset at some point to say, mm -hmm. hey, what's going on here? Yeah, I mean, I'm seeing more and more companies take on independent directors earlier on mm -hmm. in their evolution than they used to, and yeah. that's that's also a great way to add diversity, right? Um, yeah. So. When you were referring to, are you referring to that uh, guy, uh, Jurbakish Chahal? Oh, Gurbash, yeah. Gurbash. Yeah. You know that guy? I have met him over the years. Is he a true piece of garbage like he seems to be? <laughs> I mean, tell me honestly. I mean, I don't know him well enough, but I mean, I think, look, uh, you know, his record speaks for itself. He's right? being sued again. Yeah, yeah. For, yeah. like, uh, sexism. I mean, this time he didn't beat the person up 140 times or something. But, my God, talk about an insular board. They were supporting him. Yes. Until it, le until until it leaked. Until it leaked. Right, right. And, and that's where, you know, I'm very disappointed when that happens because at the end of the day, I mean, if you care about returns of a company, this, this created more of an issue at the end of the day than if they had taken action earlier. I mean, they were hoping it would just get swept under the rug. Yeah. But, you know, these things tend to come out when they're this, this uh, Yeah, serious. when there's a video of yeah. you 
smothering and beating your girlfriend and hitting her over a hundred times, it's going to come out. Yeah. What are these people thinking on that board? Right. It's and, insanity. Yeah. I, 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 I really couldn't. I mean, I do believe it because I've seen this in, in different situations happen again and again, and, and it's... Um, the cover-ups you're talking right, about. Right, right, and hoping that the problems go away, but they rarely do, and it usually costs the money and the investor, you know, the company and the investors money in the long term, right? And 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 that's not being a good fiduciary, right? Yeah. The company or your LPs. Okay, so tell me about your, your fund, uh, futureperfectventures.com. Mm-hmm. How old is the fund? How big is the fund? You founded your own fund after yes. working. You worked for a midi art too for a while, yes. didn't you? Yes. So I was at Intel. Um, I was at New Venture Partners. Sure. Um, and uh, that's an old school firm, New Venture Partners. Yeah, they're uh, they spun out of Lucent. Got uh, it. We were doing uh, spin outs out of Corporate Labs, a really early stage mm. uh, orphan technology, and then um, incubating and spinning out. Does that ever uh, work? It, it it does, and really? when it does, it works really well, right? Because you're getting in at the founding level, and mm. um, and then so there's um, something inside the company that they're just not going to use, but they may have put ten million dollars into yes. it, and they're like, hey, can you venture arm go? Right. Mm- Get us some return on investment for this because yeah. we're not going to use it. And I have to say, like, there's probably a time where that model worked better, mm. and and because there there are a lot of companies that have these large R and D labs, right, where yeah. it didn't matter if some of that never got commercialized. So British Telecom, Philips and Eindhoven, and uh, IBM. I worked on some speech recognition technology out of uh, they IBM. Were, they were so far ahead of everybody yeah. in speech recognition. Yeah, My God. I mean the problem is that they never really fully commercialized it, right? Right. Um, so all of these companies that had these large efforts um, and and were open to um, having a, a venture partner come in and and uh, share the economics of founding companies uh, that spun out. Yeah. Um, what's the number one project that should be spun out of a big company right now oh. in your mind? Wow. <laughs> any company, any project that would just be better off if it was a standalone company right now. It would, just, it would go 10x, it would go 5x, whatever. If you could wave a magic wand, be on the board of and fund a company to spin out of another company, what would it be? Product, service. I'm making my list right now in my mind. Oh, my goodness. That's such a good question. That is a great question. That's a good one. <laughs> Oof. Oof. I, got, I got my list here. Um, mm-hmm. do, 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 I don't know. Do, do, I have to think do, about do. that one. Well, just take me through your process. What are some of the ones you're thinking of? Well, I mean, I, I you know, I, I've been spending a lot of time in the the financial sector, right? And oh. and so I, I'm, I'm just thinking through if there is anything, you know, any ideas that um, – because you know, I feel like everything's been so proprietary mm-hmm. in a lot of these uh, larger uh, financial firms, and it's not the most efficient to do that. So maybe yeah. there are processes or products that can be taken ah, out. Ah, um, the financial firms. Yeah. That would be brilliant. Um, yeah. So somebody's got like a fund or yeah. something inside of a, a financial institution or a product. Yeah. Yeah. Um, go out and independently. I mean, some software, yeah. you know, that, I mean, you have to be careful because some of, they, they consider everything proprietary. <laughs> and, right. and, and, and that was, you know, that was one, always one of the challenges because sometimes you'd show them the value of spinning it out and they'd want to, they want to keep it, but you know that they weren't going to be able to, you know, really benefit as fully from it if it's internal. See, that that's the, external. that's the way to look at it is what is being held back yeah. because it's inside of something bigger. Right. That would then on its own, becomes so much more whatever. I immediately think yeah. of Amazon Web Services mm-hmm. or YouTube from a consumer guy. Well, so it's, it's everything that's been bought and, uh, you know, and, you then, ta- and or, then you spin But it. Web like Services is built internal. Like the PayPal, the PayPal has to be separated. Right. Okay, so back to your firm, yeah. futureperfectventures.com, future PVC on Twitter. Uh, how many people work at this firm? Is it a firm of one? How big is it? How often do you invest? What's the, what's the footprint here? Yeah, so it, it's me as a founder, and I've taken on a few um, uh, like venture partners. I have a design partner who uh, really helps portfolio companies with products um, mm. because you know, a lot of stuff I look at, the thesis is around smart data analytics and decentralization. So there's kind of a lot of technology in these companies, and sometimes they really need help in, in figuring out you know product and user interface, and, and that's why Emily came on board. Um, and then I have a great advisory board of folks folks, um, mm. including Naveen, uh, who uh, was one of the founders of Foursquare, sure. uh, Deborah Estrin, who is a professor of comp sci um, mm. at uh, the new Cornell 
campus, and she focuses on M, M Health, which you know is, I think, a very interesting area. When you say M Health, you mean mobile health? Yeah, mobile health. Um, yeah, how is that shaping up? Why why are you um, bullish on that? Well, uh, we're seeing, um, and I think we, you know, we're seeing a lot of applications. Um, I mean, if you look at you know the Apple Health Kit now, that is you know off uh, aggregating a lot of um, you know our our data um, in terms of steps, and, and then they're opening up an API where other uh, companies can build on that data and integrate into it. Um, I, I, you know, we're seeing more and more people like collecting their own. Information, right? And 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 I, I consider it, you know, they're empowering themselves with their data, and so that data residing, you know, at the hospital or the doctor's office. Right, and, and it's new data that doesn't even exist in some cases. Right, right. Where does that all lead? I mean, if we if we take this next step to having our health record on our phone and yeah. we control it now, yeah. what's the benefit five or ten years from now when we have, let's say, we're a decade from now? That's always a good, uh, mm-hmm. you know, arc to look at uh, for history. Ten years from now, we all have our data. Mm-hmm. Of the past ten years, our weight, whatever steps, you know, blood mm-hmm. pressure. Well, what's going to happen? What's what's going to change in our lives? Well, what, I think what's what, the opportunity? what we need to do is not only collect that data, but right. uh, analyze it. And and mm. I don't think the person should have to do it. I think uh, companies are going to crop up that are analyzing this data in a very personalized way for this person. So if I know that they have, uh, you know, diabetes and and have had. You know, a few angioplasties, and and um, they're a certain age. Then, and there's all this data on them. And you know, what do they need to do? What day to day changes do they need to make? Like, are they eating the right things? And you know, you're able to track a lot of that better. And we we need to get better about tracking some of these things. And I think it's going to empower people to live healthier lives. Um, you know, if there's a question on whether people want that right now, right? Yeah. Because sometimes ignorance is bliss. For but sure. but I you know I think we can take a lot of costs out of the healthcare system. Um, uh, but, you know, right now we're so reactive and, um, you know, I, I think we can move medicine and care to a much more preventive model, which is, is better for individuals as well as the industry. Let me ask you a big sweeping question. This is we're on big sweeping ones like health. <laughs> what do you think is happening in the world in terms of borders and employment and how work gets done in the world? Because you mm-hmm. see a lot of the emerging markets. I think that's a better way to say it than third world. Yeah. Like emerging markets yeah. versus the retiring market of Europe, <laughs> the the giving up market of Europe. Like we're we're not going to work. We're just going to go on vacation. <laughs> the United States still seems to be striving. Asia and mm-hmm. South America seem to be. My gosh, they want all of our jobs and they want success in the middle class to emerge. Mm-hmm. What do you see in terms of employment? on a global basis with Mm -hmm. these startups because they are becoming very global uh, in terms of what countries they operate in. Many are, Mm -hmm. you know, operating in 50 countries. Yeah. Yeah. And and that's part of the thesis of of the fund too, is, you know, this global network that I've built over, you know, time Mm -hmm. um, is really valuable to startups at a much earlier stage than it used to be valuable. It used to be, you know, if they got one market, and then they go to other markets. And so with this employment question, um, I, I, I think this whole idea, the freelance economy, which is just growing, um, I, uh, especially in some of, you know, in like the U.S. and, and, and I, I, whereas I think the emerging markets are, are, you know, you're having multinationals grow in, in some of those places as well as startups. So, I mean, mm-hmm. those, those countries are in a pure growth mode across the board, yeah. right? Um, and, but I, I think this whole idea of this freelance economy and, and then all these services, you know, you have Q and you have like Postmates and all of these that I think they have to figure out, you know, how to maximize kind of the human capital that hmm. they're utilizing. I don't think they're quite there in doing that because there's a lot of churn. And, and so I, I just think we have to start thinking about work and the way people work very differently. What will it look like? I mean, do you think people are just going to work 10 hours a week, 20 hours a week in cities and then go live outside the cities and, you know, cheaper existences, which in a way is what happened in China, where people mm-hmm. go to the factories and then take their long trade ride back to the north and, you know, live for a couple of months, you yeah. know, on the farm, as yeah. it were. 
So it's interesting. I have a lot of friends um, in, you know, in the urban planning world, and, yeah. and we talk about this a lot because there's one group of folks that thinks that you know we're going to become more urban societies uh, globally. Yeah, right? and that has and, been the trend. And that has, and and uh, well, there there was a time when people were moving the suburbs out of the cities, right in the '70s. Sure. And, and 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 now we're reversing that and going back into the urbanization. Um, and then there are other folks who just believe that, you know, because of the Internet and, and being able to work remotely, that actually, you know, we're going to see spreading out of, of people to, uh, right? to lower cost. So, you know, I'm a city girl, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, like, I, I like uh, the city. <laughs> I, I, you know, and, and I, I see so many benefits of being in a city and having that density and that face to face. I mean, New York, I mean, you know, I love the, New York. The, yeah, there's uh, and, and I think that's been a key factor in how. You know, the startup scene has grown there. It's because yeah, of that proximity it. and the face-to-face. -face. Collisions. Yeah, yeah. And um, so I don't think that's going to go away. And you look at something like Mumbai, right? And I spent a lot of time in India. And it's um, these cities are just booming, right? People are still moving into the cities. It's um, And so I think that's really... How many people in Mumbai? Is this like 20 million people now or something yeah, crazy? It's, it's, I don't know what Tens the latest is. Yeah. It's just, it's just like massive They're dwarfing humanity. like Manhattan's, you know, whatever, 5, 10 million people. And oh, yeah. this idea that there, you know, 10 million people come to Manhattan Island or something during the day and right. there's 4 or 5 million there. It's like... Yeah, yeah there come to are, Shanghai or <laughs> yeah. Beijing or Mumbai, like a ride a you know ride a train during rush hour there. <laughs> What's it like? Oh, it's people hanging off you know the edges and on the outside. Yeah, yeah. literally <laughs> riding right. on the top of the train. Uh, you know, in their in their work clothes. It's uh, yeah. It's madness. It's it's great. It's great to see the growth there. Yeah, I I, I kind of feel like there's something weird happening in the United States with you don't know, have this big debate over the minimum wage. Mm -hmm. And then you look at hiring for startups, and we both invest in startups that are not necessarily in a major city. And they're like, okay, one group of people is paying 60000 for an engineer, and another mm -hmm. group is paying one sixty. Mm -hmm. And you're like, it's the same quality of engineer. What's the difference? Yeah. And it's like, oh, $3,500 a month in rent in one city. Yeah. And six hundred dollars in rent in another. Yeah. How can we have the same minimum wage in two places that have a five or six or seven x cost of living difference? Yeah. It's it's madness. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I can't believe you know I come out here to San Francisco like once a month. I used to live out here, yeah. and I um I can't believe how the city is just um I mean not able to handle <laughs> a, a lot you know from an infrastructure standpoint. This place right? is completely dysfunctional compared yeah. to a place like our city in New York. <laughs> Like a real city. It's not, the San Francisco is not a real city. They run it like it's. Like a village. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to offend everybody. I live here now. But let me tell you something. If I ran this city, I would Giuliani up this city like you wouldn't believe. I mean, they're going to take this clip and run it when I run for mayor. They're going to Giuliani it up. But I, when I, I mean it in the good sense of like, we're going to have mass transit that runs on time. Yeah. And that's efficient. And yeah. enough with the nonsense where yeah. people can't move around the goddamn city. And everybody thinks they can have street parking. Yeah. In this city, people think they should be entitled to not only park on the street, but double park. Yeah. Like they're in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn or Bensonhurst, where I grew up in Bay Ridge. They... Well, let me ask you, did, did you do you think that the city was prepared for all the growth? Because the tech companies, a lot of them have moved. Yeah. North. Did they not expect it? Because I feel like, you know, they aren't they weren't prepared. For it's a really this interesting growth. thing. I'm doing the research on it. I'm listening on Audible, not a sponsor of this episode, but has been a sponsor in the past. I love Audible. Thank you. Um Audible, uh, Season of the Witch by David Talbot. We've got to make a note, Jackie. We've got to have him on the program, uh, Emmy Award winning producer Jackie. Um, and in this book, he goes over the history of San Francisco and how all these people came here in the summer of love. Um, and all these kids ran away from home and they camped out in the park. And the permissiveness and openness of this city is truly beautiful and one of its great strengths. Mm -hmm. It's also the fact that everybody believes that hippies and poor people and people with no jobs or whatever, like that recreational, like living outside is mm -hmm. cool and groovy. They're like hobos. And it's like, so there's, there's a, there's a camp that exists here over decades that feels like it should be a very open, you know, hippie, you know, society. And they're kind of getting, they're losing their San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's a bummer. Mm -hmm. Just like when, in New York, when I grew up, we yeah. lost the Lower East Side. We lost the yeah. meatpacking interest. We lost to all these like people from China and Europe buying up all the apartments and not living in Manhattan. And it sucked. Mm -hmm. And I get it. It totally sucked for me when I was in New York in like the 90s. Like, I had an apartment that was like literally $9 a square foot per year in a legal commercial loft that I lived in for years. 
And now it's like, well, everybody just moved to Brooklyn. The cool stuff's going on there. Mm-hmm. That's what has to happen here. And then people have to get okay with that concept mm-hmm. that like the cool kids can move somewhere else and let the rich people take this part of the city or the city can gentrify and keep growing. Mm -hmm. And then that has this trickle down effect to everybody. There's more employment, there's more jobs. Yeah. Because I think that's the key, right? Managing it in a way that, that reaches everybody. And I I just see this, like this struggle that's happening here. Um, And uh, it's happened to a lesser extent in New York, but I think it's partly because of, of uh, the, the management has been, you know, pretty solid over the last, uh, decade plus Bloomberg and Giuliani like you can on the fringe you know disagree with a lot of different things that they did obviously it's bad things too but you know what they did do was really think on an operational basis on how to keep the city humming Mm -hmm. and you know you can take the subway an hour outside of Manhattan and find a place to live to this day for 800 bucks or something right you can Mm -hmm. find an apartment way out in Queens or way out in Brooklyn or Staten Island and still come into the city and still be part of it Mm -hmm. here you know, like to get from the, the you know, inner Richmond to downtown here, it might be an hour. Mm-hmm. And it, that's like five. Isn't that like, what the Hyperloop is supposed to? Yeah, the, I'm, <laughs> I'm an investor in it. Um, <laughs> okay. Actually so really, that, there we uh, go. <laughs> I'm an investor in the new Hyperloop company, but it's not going to work in city. It's going to be like okay. get you out of the city. But that would be a really kind of interesting concept, actually, for the Hyperloop, which we've been talking about. I don't know how much I'm supposed to talk about. i got to talk to Shervin uh, about what I'm allowed to say. But um Let's say you could have a drop-off point in Oakland, or let's say in the middle here, and it went underground, and I don't know what's east of here, but let's say two hours east or two hours south of here was a big, open, gorgeous, you know, swath of land that nobody cared about, Mm -hmm. and you built a city there. Mm -hmm. You could literally build a city between here and Los Angeles and hyperloop both ways and get into the city in under 30 minutes, 20 minutes, Mm -hmm. because you'd be going 1,000 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. It'd be insane. Yeah, that 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 sounds pretty cool. I guess the the challenge is replicating. You know, it's 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 you're not going to be able to replicate a city that's been around for a while, right? And and I mean, no, they've tried to do these satellite cities in places around the world. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. You know, Brooklyn yeah. was a satellite city. You know, <laughs> people were like, when I grew up in Brooklyn, it was like, you know, you were fighting to get out of Brooklyn. Yeah, they didn't want you in Manhattan if you were from Brooklyn. They yeah. were like, no bridge and tunnel. Now they don't allow the Manhattan Heights into, into Brooklyn. Brooklyn. Yeah, no. Right. When you went to Manhattan, I tell this story before on the show, and I would try to get in. I would try to get into a club. I was underage, whatever. We had like fake driver's licenses. We would get our driver's licenses to have addresses um, in Manhattan mm-hmm. because when we first got our fake driver's licenses, or I got my brother's driver's license or whatever to get into the Roxy or the limelight or the tunnel oh, or palladium that. or robot. <laughs> yes. I'm dating myself here. Uh, cafe society, Ca- iguana, Odeon to get into those places. If we showed up with the Brooklyn ID on the weekends or whatever, they would look at the Brooklyn ID, they hand it back to me and say, no bridge and tunnel, wow. no B and T. And I was from I, I was doing that from Jersey. Oh, forget it. <laughs> so, forget it. But Jersey. I, but I'm a I'm a woman, yes. so it was easier. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, it was a little slightly it. easier, but it, you know, it's, now it's the exact opposite, right? right? Everybody, all the cool kids are in uh, Brooklyn. Um, so your fund is. Uh, so I launched it uh, a year ago. Congrats. Uh, thank you. Thank you. It's It's been great. And uh, I have 15 portfolio companies. Nice. What do you uh, put? 50K? 100K? 250K? Oh, no. What's your I, average? I do up to 500. Okay. Yeah, up to 500. So it's sort of like a homebrew kind of situation. You, you yeah, and it. I like to lead when I can. Uh, uh, I've done a lot of leads over, over the well, 16 let's do, years. Let's do something again. Yeah, I'd love to. We did yeah. Abra. Yeah. What else have we done? I, I saw you did Open Garden. They were a launch festival company too oh, back in the day. Yeah. 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 Explain what Open Garden does. It's a cool company. So uh, they have created this uh, wireless mesh network technology. So uh, you don't need to have access to the internet. Mm-hmm. Uh, use uh, phones connect to each other and kind of like a daisy chain to then Wi-Fi be able and Bluetooth to, to yeah, do that. Yeah. And it, it, you don't have to actually pair devices the way you have to do with Bluetooth. This just happens automatically. Right. Um, and so I, I've looked. Uh, you know, there are a lot of applications in, in emerging markets for, sure. for this, you know, where there is not Internet access um, always or in crowded stadiums like the stadium, you know, the 49ers stadium. Sure. I mean, yeah, the, the Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi goes down. Nobody yeah, can yeah. communicate. Uh, so this would remedy that. Um, yeah. The interesting thing that I think they're working on is this, this messenger, right, where you're going to be able to message with each other. Mm-hmm. And then let's say you and I are offline, but Jackie's online mm-hmm. and then Jackie, we could all of our messages can be synced and encrypted. Yep. But then when some, the first time somebody gets online, we could be communicating with each other in the stadium yep. over this mesh network connected over Wi-Fi automatically because we all have the app. But then the second one of us gets an outside line, 
all of our messages go out like in a store and forward kind of way. Yeah. Yep. Which would be so brilliant for like the emerging markets where yep. we could all be just sitting here texting and trying to get our messages out. And then somebody takes their bicycle up the road, yeah. hits the whatever satellite, Wi-Fi, and everybody gets their stuff delivered. What's, yep. What other things in your portfolio are, are just breaking out? What, what do you have a lot of like um, – Hope for. Well, I think BitPesa is is very interesting. You know, what is BitPesa? They're, they're, they're creating um, a a Bitcoin network for Africa. So they start off in in Nairobi, where you know, as we've talked about, mm-hmm. mobile money is. I mean, people are used to transacting, mm-hmm. you know, with their phones, and uh, so just trying to get people to start using uh, Bitcoin infrastructure to do remittances so in and out of the country and it could be in and out of Africa or pan Africa I mean it's expensive to yeah. transfer money within Africa too from yeah. like Nigeria to Kenya or you know Kenya to Tanzania and and so and there's really no solution right now outside of like a Western Union and uh, BitPesa can do it for you know like at less than like it's probably around a third of, of uh, the fees right um, and and uh, it's also uh, what where they're getting a lot of traction too is with businesses um, mm. you know who need to pay employees uh, uh, in, in in Kenya from you know Europe or you know this cross-border uh, payment flows um, and and so uh, I, you know, that, that's one that I'm very excited about because, again, it's like an opera where, you know, really showing the promise of what mm. digital currency can do. Uh, there's one that will be announced in a couple weeks, which, uh, stay tuned. I'm extremely Ooh. excited about that one. Ooh, you can break some news <laughs> here. Yeah, yeah. You can no, break a little no. news here. What's the vertical? <laughs> Tell me the vertical. No. I, uh, it's the general uh, e-commerce. It's in hardware. Let's just say hardware. Hardware. Okay, that's fine. That's hardware. fine. I like yeah. hardware. Yeah. Uh, are you scared of hardware as an investor and the capital intensity of it? No, I'm not. I, okay. you know, Why? I, I think. Why are you not um, Look, um, I, I, I think you need to find entrepreneurs who understand how hard it's going to be. Ah. Um, and so it is harder. I, I, yeah, I do think it's harder. I mean, you asked if I was scared of it. Right. No, I'm not scared, scared of, of hard work. Yeah. <laughs> so it's harder. Yeah, it is harder. And I think that's where you have to make sure the team grasps that, right? Like where, I mean, we've seen so many uh, companies, you know, um, do these uh, Kickstarters, right, for hardware yeah. products and not deliver for, Oops. Um, you know, how much, you know, like they're, they're ones that haven't delivered for over a year. Um, past their promise date and have collected money and and um, and collected venture capital money after that and still can't hit it. Yeah, yeah. So it's um, kind of disturbing. Yeah, yeah. And and so it's really important to make sure the entrepreneur understands the economics and and real. I mean, I think entrepreneurs always underestimate you know dollars <laughs> that are going to have to go into you know hitting that huge market share that they're projecting, right? Um, and, and hardware, yeah, I think you have to build in even more a cushion because yep. I think there's more that can go wrong in the actual, you know, device or product. So, yeah, it's interesting. I, uh, I've met with a lot of hardware companies that did successful Kickstarters or Indiegogo's or Tilt's not picking on any one of those platforms, but they did their budget. They hit, they went way past their goal mm-hmm. and then they started to execute and realized, oh, well we, you know, did 500 K let's say we really need 1.5 to actually make this happen. We're going to lose literally $100 on every unit we ship for 200 Or we're going to lose 200 for every dollar. Because it's like, oh, we have to build the app. Oh, we have to build the infrastructure. Oh, we have to build the server. Oh, we have to have customer support. Yeah. They, they're, they're just like, well, this we can build this for like 100 bucks, so we'll sell it for 110 and we'll make 10 bucks. And it's like, yeah. well, who's going to build the app? Oh, I didn't think of that. Right, one. right. Who's going to pick up the phone and yeah. take it back when it's broken? Yep, yep. It's kind of scary. Yep, and which leads me to another company I'm excited about. Okay, when you're talking me. about customer service, yeah. um, there's a company called Fuse Machines, um, oh. and uh, they're based in New York. Fuse uh, Machines, what do yeah, they do? Yeah, and uh, they they have built an artificial intelligence natural language platform for customer service automation. Oh. Um, so it's kind of like next generation of what call centers do, um, and can be you know can empower, you know, call center folks uh, with uh, better information and searchable information at their fingertips or can interface directly with with customers on an AI basis and then know when to switch over to human interactions. So oh, it's that's pretty brilliant. clever, right? Yeah. I so that, like when, you know, you've talked to the machine for the third time asking the same question, they understand that. Like, it's oh, time to does it on. know when you have that frustration in your voice and you're just yes. like... They're getting there. <laughs> when, you're like, when you're like, no... I operator. Operator. 
way. <laughs> That's me when I get on those things. I'm just like, zero, 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 operator, operator, operator. I don't want to press any buttons. Don't put me down your menu. And you're an investor in the Muse, Catherine uh, yes. Minshew's company. Yes. She's been on the program. Oh, she's, she's a, great. It's she's a, a you know, She was one of those entrepreneurs that you know, Can't I met say no to. a long time ago. Um, just loved loved her persistence, her vision, and also her uh, willingness and wanting to learn, you yeah. know, and, and grow in areas. I mean, she's always been like, you know, a superstar in my mind, but like where, you know, what she's learned over just the last couple of years or three years since I met her and, and um, I mean, she, and, and how she incorporates feedback, I think is something that, you know, all entrepreneurs, I mean, it'd be great if all entrepreneurs uh, did that. Yeah. She's a dynamo. Yeah. Hey, let me ask you something about, uh, while we're wrapping up here. Um, when you heard the Ellen Powell verdict, mm-hmm. where were you and what was your reaction? How did you feel as a woman VC? You know, people keep asking me that. And, I mean, the lawsuit was filed three years ago, yeah. right? I mean, it's been out there for yeah. a while. Um, I, it, It's interesting, like, being in New York. So I was out here, uh, like, in the middle of March. Yeah. Uh, so while the trial was going on, I was out here for meetings and Everybody was talking about it. I mean, it was, you know, it was like... Talking but, about it, like, face-to-face, but right. not on Twitter and yeah, not that, on I blogs. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, but, you know, in Koopa Cafe, every single table was talking about it. Yep. And it was, it was fascinating. Where in New York, you know, I'd say a lot of people I talked to were not even aware it was mm. going on. So I, I think there was definitely more attention here. Sure. <laughs> um, you know, obviously because it was taking place here and, yeah. and so many people are, um, you know, affiliated with the Yeah, you know involved, the principles, right? Yeah, right? yeah right. you know people who were, I mean, I knew, like, I was like watching the people testify. I was like, I know that person, I know that yeah, person, I know that yeah, person. Wow, right. I, this is incredible. Yeah, yeah. It's like so, the trial of the century for Silicon right. Valley in a way. Exactly. Um, so I, you know, I, I wasn't surprised by the verdict. You thought um, she was going to lose. I mean, yeah, I, I you know, I, I think it, it's a very hard uh, distinction to make. I mean, if you look at what the jury was being tasked with, right? Right. Um, and and um, and and it's hard to you know directly link the the discrimination to the you know lack of promotion, et cetera. Right. I mean, especially in an industry where. You know, there's not a lot of documentation around this, and you yeah. know, and and so no, it didn't. It didn't surprise me. Uh, what did surprise me was the just the, the amount of attention being paid to it. And I yeah. think you know, versus when the lawsuit was first filed, I think a lot of things have happened in the market, right, mm. where that make people pay more attention to this. Sure. The diversity numbers were released in Silicon yeah, Valley, they were pretty, right? Pretty brutal. Um, and so all of that's been picked up mm. uh, and gotten a broader audience than you know just like just that one. Case. Right. And and so I think it's 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 a moment in time where, you know, it does matter. I mean, and then you have Hillary Clinton running for office and, you know, so I th- and then the gender pay issue that's um, been in the news. Right. So it's a lot of things that hmm. have accumulated. There were some people who were crushed by her not winning. They mm-hmm. felt like she deserved to win. Did you think she deserved to win or you don't know enough? I don't know enough. I mean, no. I wasn't in those rooms. I mean, I'm in the industry, but I, I you know, I've never worked at, at yeah. that firm. And um, Connor has a lot of women working there, as I think what a lot of people said, like this is the most diverse of all the funds, except Mm -hmm. for the female led ones, obviously. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do do you think Kleiner is like, um, do you think this is like if any firm was going to be singled out, this is the wrong one to single out? You know, I I hear that again and again. Because that has Uh, nobody wants to bring that up, by the way. Right. right? But I want to have a frank discussion here. I'm not saying that's my position either, by the way. Just. But, you know, look, I mean, a lot of the stuff that went on was egregious, right? Um, Hmm. Regardless of which firm it was. I mean, some of those things need to change, right? Like the guy, the guy who (laughs) she had the affair with, that guy was like a predator. On right. the prowl. I mean, again, I don't know, you know, but but there's. Well, he clearly was. It was documented yeah, I mean, that he's banging on people's yeah, doors I mean, in the middle look, of the night. There are certainly characters like that in in many different industries, yeah. and I've encountered it, you know, it, it, you know that that sort of thing repeatedly in in my career. Really? So, Did you punch the guy uh, in the face, or you just? <laughs> what as a woman? Let me ask you seriously. Like, do you want to just punch these guys in the face, or do you just have to kind of like laugh it off and brush it off and be like, no, and like. Because you don't want to mix the stir the pot and create a big issue out of it because you want to stay focused on your work. Well, I, I think, you know, the, the key here, and when I talk to male friends about this, right, is that it's not just one 
event that happens, right? Mm -hmm. Like women who are at a certain point in their career, most likely if they're in a male dominated world have encountered many of these different, mm -hmm. you know, which on their own, I mean, some of these, you know, on their own are a big deal, but, but, you know, are not a big deal like day yeah. to day. Right. And and then, but there are enough of those where you realize there's, there's a culture here. Yeah. Um, uh, that's, you know, not the most welcoming for other folks, right? And it, it's, it can be women, it can be people with accents, it can be lots of different things, people who didn't go to certain schools, right? Yeah, I mean, that was and, the, fa was that the famous Paul Graham quote where it's like, if you have a thick accent, it really is hard to raise money. I think he said that, right? Yeah, I think he said that, yeah. 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 How did you feel when you heard that one? Um, you know, I, 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 look, I agree with a lot of what's said out there. Um, and, 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 and I don't know, again, th things are taken out of context, right? Yeah, I think, so I, I think I that was the key with him. I, I think it was taken out of context. Yeah. He was saying like, it is like the reality is it can be harder, right? It, yeah. That, like yeah. if I'm operating in Japan yeah. and I, ha I think his point was like, if I was in Japan and yeah. my partner's Japanese and is a native speaker right? and you go to a pitch meeting, let the Japanese guy or woman talk yeah. and the English person would yeah. Maybe do the Q and A. Yeah. But if your accent is so thick that nobody can understand you, right? Like, let somebody else on your team present yeah, or was, really work on it. About the communication and how yeah. important communication is. Now, I would like to live in a world where you know a lot of this doesn't really matter. That um, you know, and and I and I actually think that's where you know one of like if you look at where I think my fund adds a lot of value yeah. is the fact that like I've done business in I don't know how many different countries I've heard. Yeah. I don't know how many different accents. I'm like, you know, I didn't speak English when I moved to this country. Right. I uh, learned it while I was in school. Oh, you didn't. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, how old were you when you got uh, five? Yeah. And, oh my God. It's uh, my daughter's age. Was that, do you remember like having to struggle with it or what that was like? Yeah, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know. English is supposed to be an easy language to learn, but I had trouble with it. <laughs> but, but um, you know, I grew up in a neighborhood where there really, um, there wasn't much diversity. And so I'm kind of used Jersey. to... In Jersey. Yeah, yeah. And in the 70s. Where in Jersey were you from? Um, a small town called Branchburg. Okay. A lot more diversity now. Yeah. Um, it's in Somerset well, I, County, but... I used to go to Ridgewood, New Jersey in the summers. But oh, were you in yeah. northern Jersey? Or it's central. Central, So yeah. it, literally right between Philly and New York. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, so um, people were just like, who is this person? Right. So and I, where I are you from? And making fun to, of your name. They right. never heard your name before. Yeah. Well, my brother had it much worse. So. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Why? But, but he well, his, name, his name translate. Yeah. Uh, I, I probably can't say it. Uh, Why not? Uh, oh. You can say it. I mean, uh, unless it's up to him, he doesn't have to say <laughs> it. I don't care. Who cares? But, but I just yeah. say, like, you know, when you come from that oh. kind of uh, background of, of, of having experienced it, you're a lot more sensitive, sure. sensitive to it. Um, I remember when, set the seventies. You know. We, we, I think we're probably the similar age. I grew up, yeah. I bought, I was born in 1970, but I grew up in the seventies and eighties. And it was like, there was definitely like, you know, diversity isn't like it is today where like these yeah. young people don't, these Gen Y people, this earth connected generation, they're not really, they don't see race the same way because yeah. there's so many mixed race kids. Yeah, it's great. It's I mean, awesome. it's just so great to see how far we've come and not that long of a time, right? So. Yeah, I think when we're like, you know, when we're grandma and grandpas and we're like the old people at the table at Thanksgiving <laughs> when we're like 80 or 90, like just like my grandmother and God rest her soul and like our grandparents were like, they were like the last racists like in our family. Like we're like, oh my God, grandma, don't say those kind of things. Like one time she said something like unbelievably offensive, um, like she literally said the N word at Thanksgiving. I mean, she had like dementia towards the end, but like literally my 90 year old grandma says the N word at dinner. I'm with my Puerto Rican girlfriend Wow. at dinner and everybody's just like grandma, yeah. you know, like, and I think that's like the last generation. Like they're just, they're gone. You know, like I don't, nobody thinks that way. And then how can you be racist if you're multiracial? Right. It becomes kind of hard, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's kind of a wonderful place we're going. Yes. And, you know, I think technology is a big connector of all of us, right? Yeah. Um, and it's been uh, great in, in that, in that you know, there's been a lot that's come along with it where, you know, we have to be careful and, and guided, I think, in, in the right ways. Yeah. God, I hope we live in a post-racial world. It's like we're kind of like going to be this last chance. We, we might see it. Like, I think we're kind of getting there. You see all these... Poor black kids getting shot on television by cops. It's kind of makes you. Yeah, I think sometimes wonder. when you're in places like San Francisco or New York, yeah, you, you get forget, a different view like, in the south. You know, you're you're living in, um, 
you know, in unique places, right, that are sometimes closer to like a London or Mumbai than it is to, you know, somewhere um, in the the middle of the country. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I think, you know, we've come a long way. We have a long way to go. And I think think we're headed in the right direction. Yeah. I love this idea of like the VCs who can see across the borders. I think that's a huge advantage for the companies that align themselves with you. Disadvantage for aligning yourself with me because I don't know anything and I'm afraid to go to other countries. <laughs> but we'll come and back. Right? We'll we'll you get the best of both worlds. You get the kid who's <laughs> right. from Brooklyn and you get the girl from Jersey. All right. Uh, Jalik Jobin Putra, I can I could have you on the program every week. This is uh, great to talk with you. You're good. You have an opinion. You're good for radio. Oh, yeah. I love Anybody ever videos. tell you you're good on radio? Like, you're good. Oh, uh, well, you're yeah. You're good. You have an opinion. <laughs> you're willing to talk about stuff. It's good Lots radio. Lots of opinions. <laughs> I'd love to be back. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so any, everybody follow Jalak. J-A-L-A-K. J-A-L-A-K. Absolutely. Jalak. Yes. There you go. It means uh, glimpse in Hindi. It does mean glimpse in yeah. Hindi. Wow, that's unique. And Jason means nothing in Greek. It just means Jason in the argument. Actually, you know what? I'm actually a, I think I'm a hero. I think Jason and the Argonauts. I mean, technically, I'm a hero. I'm not like a god or like a son of a god. Like okay, I'm going to quote you on that. But I'm a hero. I'm a hero. I'm a hero. That's, a a third, that's a third level down. We're 80 minutes in. My producer's going to kill me. <laughs> thank you so much, Jalik, for coming on the program. And thank you to Jacob and Jackie for producing the program. And all of you should thank Jackie and Jacob for producing the program. They do such a great job. Follow the show at TWI Startups. And thank you to Moo and Wissia for making independent media like This Week in Startups possible. We couldn't do it without you. Thanks to WeWork for giving me my great office uh, here and my beautiful studio. Such a great group of people. If you want to work at a WeWork, they're in like every city and growing like a weed. They raised a ton of money. Just great people work at that company. And why would you like sign a huge lease when you can just rent desks for five or six hundred bucks and a little tiny office that's beautiful and gorgeous and yours and you can lock the door. I love we work. There's a lot of we works in New York. Yeah, yeah. They're everywhere. They're, a lot of your startups are in we works, huh? They're they're replicating quickly, yes. It's so much better than back in the yeah. day when we had to like go argue with the landlord and sign these huge leases and give off we literally had to give like maybe twenty five percent of our cash or a third of our cash up front, up front yeah. to a landlord which yeah. would put it in a goddamn like note that we wouldn't have control of for five years. That made like 0.5 interest. Yeah. Oh, so, so horrible. Thank you, WeWork, for solving that big pain point. And we'll see you all next time on This Week in Startups. Bye-bye. (laughs) 